What's going on, fellas? This is, uh, hold on, sir. What is the individual behind the keys? Arthur, you, you, you're with me all night. That, that sounded weird. You're with me right now. Um, I'm going to pray and uh, just ask God to do what only he can do. And it's, it's such an honor to be here. And I guess you could play that, uh, although we changed it. I didn't mind the great Are You Lord song. I thought it was good too. What are you feeling? Isn't it funny the moment you hear keys, everything sounds better? Uh, just flying in here today, I just really felt like um, it's uh, an extreme honor and it means a lot to me to be here tonight, and especially driving by packed football stadiums on a Friday night. I'm thinking, whoever's going to skip these important games to be where it really matters, um, I feel like God has something for you. And uh, I don't know, I don't know how you came to be here, but uh, I'm, I'm a friend of this church, and I just want to take a moment before we sit down, I just want to honor your pastor. And I don't say that as, um, yeah, go ahead, we can give this man of God a huge shout. Go ahead, take 10 seconds and just let him know you love him. And I know uh, if you're not familiar with, um, with church culture, sometimes you can hear guys do this that come in, and I've been on both ends of that where somebody will honor somebody else. It almost feel contrived, um, but that's, that's not the case here. I believe honor brings a blessing. And I believe it's a godly thing to do, and I think in an age where everybody's real quick to criticize each other, the church can be a place that shows it's still okay to clap for somebody else and to let somebody else know what they mean to you. And uh, I'm here because your pastor has been uh, a faithful friend to me. Uh, the moment we planted a church in Manhattan, um, he, he told me, he said, hey, I got your back. And I believed him because he's, he's got a giant back. Anyway, but when you plant a church, when you first start it, everybody says they're with you. About two months in, you find out basically 97% of those people didn't mean it. Your pastor, I kid you not, and I will not cry because I already feel less manly <laughs> being in this church, but um, I feel like uh, every, every single week for nine years running, I get a text every week from one guy, and it's your pastor, and he just says, Carl, I love you, praying for you. Just know that here in Texas, we're behind you. God is for you, not against you. He'll send me those scriptures that you can't find on your own. But when you see him, you're like, wow, I didn't even know that was in the Bible. And uh, I just really appreciate it. And uh, loyalty is my value. And I, I, he, he happened to hit me randomly with a text. And I just said, thank you, sir, for always encouraging me. What can I ever do for you? Because um, he's one of those guys who doesn't look like he needs a thing. He's got it all covered. He's got a tank on the stage. And uh, he said, you know, we got this men's thing coming up on Friday. And I said, I can, I can be there on Friday. And uh, it's just an honor to be able to sow into this. And I just want you to know publicly, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for loving my family. Thank you for praying for us. And it means a lot in a city like we're in to know that there's men like you that still will care about other people to that level. So thank you. I love you dearly. Will you pray with me right now? And we're just going to believe that God's going to have his way. I don't know about you, but before you bow your head, I got over doing church meetings a long time ago. Because church meetings really don't change anybody. But the presence of God can use a church meeting to change everybody in here. And I have no idea what you came with, what your framework is. But I know tonight could be a night where everything changes for you. That's the advantage of being a Christian, y'all. We walk into any service, any given time. A stronghold can be broken. A disease can be healed. A mentality can be shifted. That is what we're in for tonight. Can I get a Pentecostal amen this late in Frisco, Texas? I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you that we desperately need you right now, Jesus. We need you in everything we do. And God, I pray you would breathe on this night. You would open up eyes that have not seen you for who you really are. Lord, you would heal brokenhearted people. Lord, you would heal sick bodies tonight. We speak miracles in this room. Lord, I pray you would draw those closer to you that have been too far for too long. Let this be a night we leave here different than we walked in. We love you in Jesus' mighty name. Faithfield Church said amen, amen, amen. Do me a favor. 
And uh, I will say this, Josh, before we sit down. Uh, I, I've known you for a while from afar, but I do believe God's hands on your life in a, in a unique and special way. It's going to shock you. So when God opens doors, don't ask questions. Just go. And you're going to see things open up that you forgot that you had prayed for. This is your season to step into that. And just so you know. Um, can you give somebody a hug of three seconds or longer just to even out all of the real manly stuff? And I'm going to preach. So you're doing good? You feel good? That's a solid hug down there. I saw that. What an honor to be in Texas. I got 43 minutes, and I'm going to use them all. Do we have any cowboy fans in the place? Yeah. Guess what? Tonight, I'm a cowboy fan. My son is 10 years old. I got two daughters, uh, a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, and my son just turned 10. And he's playing tackle football for the first time, and he is um, absolutely awesome. They had their first game, and they won uh, 42 to nothing last week. And it's awesome because I don't have to coach it, but I do still from the stands. And I have a little bounty system I've set up with a couple of the kids. And sure enough, I got to pay, pay out $40. One kid I gave 20 bucks because he got an unnecessary roughness penalty with, as the ball carrier, which I believe is criminal. It's not his fault that another kid can't deal with a forearm to the face. And uh, another one of our little DBs got a late hit that I felt was right on time. So I said, son, you get, you get yourself a hit like that every game. You come find me in the stands. $20 is your portion. Don't judge me. Charity is one thing. Pee Wee football is another. We're about those, those wins. Will you shout me down tonight? Yeah. I've been told about this faith-filled atmosphere, and it's good to actually be here. I was actually going to try to steal one of Pastor Keith's jackets in the back until I saw 6XL. I didn't even know they made stuff like that, so I won't be leaving with any cool gear that I've stolen from you. Uh, I've called this message, and it's really just kind of a piece of my heart, and I ask for permission to preach it uh, because, you know, I'm here to, to serve whatever the vision of this house is, and I do believe it might be right on time. But if you need a title, because you definitely have to have a title, if you preach without one, God can't use it. I'm getting better. Look at somebody and say, I'm getting better. That has to be something you get used to saying as a Christian, because the truth is, if you're not a Christian in here tonight, we're going to give you a chance to change that in about 41 minutes. But if you do know Jesus, whether you feel like it or not, whether anybody else notices it, whether it looks like that on a day-to-day -day basis, because God is so good, you're getting better whether you know it or not. So you need to look at your life right now and be able to say, you know what, I'm getting better. At the end of the day, because God is so good, he loves me enough to accept me exactly as I am, but he will not leave me like that. I'm getting better. Now, in fact, I don't know anybody who, who would say they don't want to get better. I think if we were honest in this room tonight uh, and we put off all the facades and I said, who in here wants to get better in life? Give me a wave. But if you even break it down further, we want to get better with our testimony. We want to get better with our thought life. We want to get better in our marriages. We want to get better as dads. We want to get better. Nobody wakes up and says, I don't want to get better, except for college kids headed for spring break. They made a conscious decision that they won't be getting better. But the problem is we get to a point as men where you have reached the end of yourself. You can't do anything more to get better, and then you're stuck unless you know the living God. We have an advantage tonight, so if there's anybody in here that feels stuck, if you feel like you have peaked, if you feel like there is something that you just cannot get over, can I introduce you or maybe reintroduce you to the power of the Holy Spirit? Because I believe Jesus gave us an advantage. I'm going to read it to you. Um, do you guys bring a Bible? I know most of y'all have memorized it. Hold it up if you have a Bible. Just let me see who's spiritual. Look at someone that doesn't have a Bible and glare at them with judgment in your eyes. And this is John chapter 16. And I'm going to fly through this, and uh, hopefully we're going to be able to pray for people and, and let God have his way. 
The context of this is Jesus is hanging out with his guys, and they're starting to get a little bit nervous because he's been dropping hints that he's not going to be around very long. And so Jesus senses this, and he lets them know a little bit of what is to come in the future. And I, I'm going to read this, and if you don't know your Bible, it can almost sound heretical, what I'm about to say. But Jesus said it so we can actually stand on it. And here's how it goes. This is John 16, verse 7. If you're there, say, I'm there. Do you like who you're sitting next to, by the way? It's too late to change, so make it work, okay? He said this, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Right away, this is mind-blowing. Because I don't know about you, if I was hanging out with Jesus, it would be fair to say it couldn't get any better. Can you imagine how cool it would be to hang out with Jesus? All the cool stuff he would have done. Can you imagine playing two-on-two with Jesus? All that to say, it would have been amazing understanding these guys had walked with the living God. And Jesus opens up by saying, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'm going to send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will no longer see me. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I still have so much more to tell you, but you can't handle it just now. But when the spirit of truth comes, come on somebody. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He's not going to speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will tell you. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and he will declare it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and declare it to you. For the ADHD among us, Jesus is saying, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to leave you alone. The Holy Spirit is going to come. And I'm going to make a bold proclamation right off the bat here. And I promise you this. If we want to continue to get better, we got to make a fresh decision tonight to live Holy Spirit-led and Holy Spirit-fed every single day of our lives. we got to make a decision to say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in my life. Because, hey, if you haven't heard it yet, the Holy Spirit is not a theory. This is not an add-on to who we are. He is the way maker. He is the chain breaker. He is the one that lifts your weary head when you don't want to get out of bed in the morning. He's the one that pulls you out of the sin that keeps draining you of the life he's given you. The Holy Spirit is the power that we live but I wonder, do you know him tonight? Are you walking in the power of the Holy Spirit? Because if you already are pushing back in your spirit, like who's this weird guy from Manhattan? Right? A lot of people, the moment you talk about the Holy Spirit, I would say this to you. If you don't lean into the Holy Spirit now, you run the risk of trying to live out a supernatural salvation on your own human power. Hey, good luck with that. Good luck serving the call of God that is on your life, on your own power. Good luck staying sexually pure. Good luck staying married longer than the average of whatever it is now, 14 hours. Good luck loving your neighbor. Good luck loving those that hate you. Good luck going to the ends of the earth to preach the gospel when we struggle to go to the end of our block. All I know is this, when we start leaning into the Holy Spirit, we get to stop striving. We get to stop trying so hard at things that are absolutely fruitless. I don't know about you, but if there's an easier way in this life, and it's God-mandated, I want it. Oh, really? Only seven people agree with me? Have you ever seen somebody... Have you ever seen somebody doing something that's really hard, and it's like no one's told them there's an easier way? We were uh, going into the airport the other day. My son and I always have this routine where we will go to the airport and we will hop on the electric walkway that we call the Holy Spirit walkway because it's bouncy and it takes you about five steps faster than everybody else. And we'll always get on there and we'll dance on there and we'll jump around on it and we'll always look to the left and to the right. And there's always people there. And my son says the same thing. He goes, Dad, why don't these people get on the Holy Spirit walkway? Has anyone told them they're allowed? And sure enough, you look to the left and you see that family that's got 19 bags, four demonic children, 
that are committing crimes and they're sweating and they're hauling their bags. We're going to the exact same gate. But it's like somebody has told them, if you work harder and you look more miserable and you carry more luggage, when you get to the gate, the gate agent's going to go, oh, look at you. You tried harder. Here's a better seat. It's never happened. You're going to get the same seat. So why on earth would you not take the easier option? This is what religion has done in the United States of America. Rather than let people know that there is a God that loves you so much, he will give you an advocate and he will give you a head lifter. Why not carry your burden? Why not carry all the stuff in your life? And I hope you make it to the end. That is not our God. The Holy Spirit wants to lift somebody's head tonight. This is who we are. And I can say this on behalf of your pastor. We are 100% dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be fooled by the weird narratives you might read about churches like ours, about cool hipster um, lights and fashionable stuff. All that stuff is not true. You know who we are? We are Holy Spirit-led Holy Spirit fed. We believe everything in this Bible is real and alive. We believe you can lay your hands on the sick and see them recover. We believe you can walk up to a dead person and call out a spirit of life because God has given us the right to do so. We believe you can speak in a language that hell itself cannot decode. It goes straight from your heart to the heavens and God uses it. We believe in the whole That's who we are because cool church isn't going to see a revival in our country. But the power of the Holy Spirit can take a little group of people, breathe on it, can change the whole world. Can I break something down for you about the Holy Spirit real quick? Can I? I believe a new chapter of revival. Just write this down if you need a heading. You don't have to take notes. But know that when preachers say that, they're judging you on the inside. I believe a new chapter of revival has to start with a renewed passion to get to know the Holy Spirit. Not more fights. Not more biblical stuff to say over coffee. I believe we want to see our country continue to turn with the power of revival. It's going to take a renewed desire of men like us to get to know the Holy Spirit again. You know, some theologians call the Holy Spirit the forgotten member of the Trinity. How crazy is that? And I got to this message because a couple months ago I was sitting in my church and I just said, I just felt that conviction. I'm sure you've had this, Pastor, where you just feel something in your in your gut. I thought, I said, Lord, when was the last time we just preached about the power of the Holy Spirit? I feel like our church is getting a little bit sanitized. I feel like our church is getting a little bit um, clean. We need to let people know what is the thing that's going to break the chains in their life. It's not going to be coming to this church every week. That helps. It's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to break down real quick, and then we'll just we'll, I'll yell and scream as much as I can, although my voice is almost gone. I feel, I'm, I feel young. I'm 40. My voice feels older. My wife says she likes it, so I'm going to roll with it. But three quick facts about the Trinity. Okay, write these down, and um, if you're new to church, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the word Bible is not in the Bible. They're both okay to use. So if you're in here right now, we believe the Trinity, God the Father, God His Son, Jesus, God the Holy Spirit. That's what we call the Trinity, and this stuff's important to know. Here's three quick facts. Number one, they are all equal, yet distinctly different. Why is this important? And some of y'all are glad I'm talking about this, because maybe you haven't known what to say. This has really affected the to help you know, non-believers understand who we are. The three are equal, yet they are all distinctly different. What does this mean? It means you're allowed to pray to God. It means you can pray to Jesus. You can call on the Holy Spirit to help you. The point is that there is this beautiful unity in diversity. If you ever wonder why would that be, I always tell people God loves us so much, he's given us three avenues to collide with his ridiculous, amazing love. So you don't have to worry about, am I praying to God too much? Am I praying to Jesus too much? Have I neglected the Holy Spirit? The point is, you get to talk to heaven. Number two, there is direct access to all three. Oh, my gosh, I need at least ten people to get that and clap. Here's what I'm telling you. You have direct access to the God of heaven and earth. 
You have direct access to Jesus. You can call on the Holy Spirit at any time. Why is this important? Because I live in a city where people still think they need a mediator. They need a priest. They need a pastor. They need rules and regulations, and they have to sanitize themselves before maybe somebody else who's more holy can talk to God on their behalf. Oh, my God. We get direct access to heaven. We have one priest. His name is Jesus. We have one outlet. It is to cry out to the God that asks to hear your voice. And you might not have realized this tonight, but I wonder, you tell me, how much are you talking to God like he hears you? When was the last time you just spent almost a whole day just speaking in tongues because you love being able to communicate with the head lifter, the chain breaker that is the Holy Spirit? I sat in an ICU recently praying for a friend who was this close to meeting eternity. And I was in the uh, ICU in the waiting room, and I was praying. I was next to a person who was there also supporting, and she was trying to pray. And I say trying because she had some beads in her hands. They had a cross, and I looked at her, and she looked really frustrated. And I said, uh, I said, ma'am, are you okay over there? She goes, yeah, I'm trying to pray, but I can't remember how many thank yous were on the left and how many Hail Marys were on the right. And I, I said, she's like, how do you pray? I said, glad you asked. I used this ancient Greek Hebrew word called help Lord please need you now she said you, you can pray like that I said ma'am I don't mean to be disrespectful but we believe this Bible teaches us we love and revere Mary she is the mother of God yet we don't pray to her because unless you rose from the dead we're not praying unless you save my life. We're not worshiping. We love the saints. They make for some cool jewelry. But there is no saint that is going to come and rescue you in your time of need. There is one that you get to cry out to, and there is one that will answer you. And I'm just tired of meeting really good men who feel like there's a barrier between them and God. I had a guy come up to me recently and said, Carl, can you pray for me? Can you talk to the big man upstairs for me? Because I've been too bad. I know you're closer to him than me. I said, bro, I'd like to let you think like that because it puts me in an elevated position, but I wouldn't be doing my job. There is no big man upstairs. He came downstairs. His name is Jesus. You're standing eye to eye with him. And he died and rose again so you and your broken, sinful life can have the exact same platform to pray. When you see men like Keith get up and preach, sometimes you can be like, man, they must have a hotline to God. They must know God better. And I always say, you know what, when you see men of God that are flourishing, it's not that they're better people or know God better. They have access to their rights over a long period of time, and you have access to the same hotline as the man who's building this church. I don't know who I'm talking to, but if you're in here and you've been hesitant to pray, pray again. If you have been quiet with your worship, worship again. If you have felt bashful in church because of your sin, be bold because of God's righteousness. You have every right to cry out to heaven. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Number three, the Holy Spirit is responsible for regeneration through sanctification. A.K.A. he's going to change your life whether you give him permission, permission or not. So that fancy word, um, does it say ultimate warrior up there? No, I'm looking at that right there. He's, he was my favorite wrestler of all time, and I just looked up there. I was like, Lord, did you do that? Regeneration through sanctification, that's the process of being made holy. This is specifically the Holy Spirit's job in your life. So if you don't know him, we're in deep trouble. Because that sanctification process, that's the Holy Spirit's job. That's when he starts to convict you of your sin. That's when he starts to attack your racist mindset that you inherited from legacies of people that did not walk with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what pushes your buttons when you're walking back into that same place where you know you should not be. It's the Holy Spirit that says there is a better way. So if you don't know the Holy Spirit, you'll never know what it feels like to get better day in and day out because he's the one that's driving it. Just make it sense to anybody. I'll even break it down even clearer. This is a really quick way to break it down. God the Father, he initiates. Let there be light. 
God the Son, he declares, I am the light of the world. God the Holy Spirit, he executes, continually bringing light to all the things in your life. And if that doesn't work, let me give you option number three to understand the Trinity, and then we'll move on. I was talking to a friend of mine who is a, how can I say this, Josh? He was a, he's a, he's a street pharmaceutical representative. <laughs> and who are sitting there talking about the Holy Spirit. He's like, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get the concept. And I was like, okay, your favorite show is Narcos, right? I don't know, y'all are too spiritual to know that show, but let's just say you know a friend that has a friend that watches this show about drug dealing in other countries. And he's like, I love narcos. I said, let me break it down for you like this, because you have to know this. I said, God the Father, he is like the cartel. He has more product than you could ever imagine. God, his son, Jesus, he's like the kingpin. Everybody knows his name. Some people fear him. Some people love him. But nobody ignores him. And I said, the Holy Spirit is like that Brooklyn drug dealer. He's the one that shows up on every corner, at every mall, in every high school, making sure, what do you need? You need an upper? I got that. You need a downer? I got that. It does no good to have a cartel. It does no good to have a kingpin if you have nobody in charge of the distribution. So if you have been looking for hope, if you have been looking for peace, if you have been looking for power and you're not looking to the Holy Spirit, you're going to miss it every time. Come on, somebody. Can we just take a second and thank God for his faithfulness to give us the advocate that is the Holy Spirit? I'll say all that to say this. You don't want to be in a spot where God expects you to be filled but you show up empty. This is what happens when you let teaching like this just kind of go in one ear, out the other, where you kind of overlook the stuff on the Holy Spirit because it's hard to understand. You will be in a position where God will open up a door, and if you are not filled to overflow, you will miss opportunities to help people. Facts. I remember a couple years ago I got a call uh, from a, a woman in our church. She said, Pastor Carl, my husband... He's in a bad way. And I knew her husband. Thank you, sir. He served our country, a couple tours overseas, and he was a pretty incredible man. He had some stuff that he came back with from the war, and it, it was messing with his mind. And so we were working through all that, and she said, I've never seen him like this. He's on the back porch, and uh, he has a gun in his hand, and he is saying stuff that I don't understand. He's foaming at the mouth. Can you please come over? I remember thinking, Yep. Be right there. I had two friends with me. We drove over to that house. And some of y'all who have dealt with clearly demonic things before, when you hear sounds that are not from this earth, it does something to your soul. And I remember standing outside this fence. I looked at my two friends, and uh, I was scared to my core. But at the same time, I felt like God was in this. I looked at one of my friends, and I said, his name was Daniel. I said, Daniel, you ready for this? And he goes, I woke up today hoping something like this would happen. <laughs> I said, all right. I looked at my other friend. I said, bro, you ready to go? He goes, you know what? Matter of fact, you know, I haven't really been living right, and uh, we haven't really talked about it, but I don't really feel like this is the best time for me to be here because I don't want to bring y'all down, so I'm going to go pray for y'all in the car, and I apologize ahead of time, and he literally ran to the car, and I respect that. I looked at my friend. I said, bro, let's do this. Either God is for us or he's not. Either the Holy Spirit's gone before us or he has not. And we hopped over that fence, and I could see it as clear now as I did then. I hopped over a fence, and I saw a man who's been through hell and back for our country standing there with his eyes rolled back and his head foaming at the mouth, saying things that were not him. And me and my friend, we just began to pray. And the closer we got, we began to speak in tongues. That's the day I found out speaking in tongues is not about doctrine. It's about survival. And we got closer to him, and we put our hands on his head, and I saw the peace of God come over his life. I saw him come back to himself and pull the gun from that table, and we prayed for my friend, and I remember God moving. And as I left and looked back on that situation, I thought, Lord, how many times have I been the third friend? where you have put something in front of me, but I didn't even see it as an opportunity. I wasn't even ready to do what you wanted me to do because I wasn't filled with what I needed to be filled with. 
I want to get better. I want to be somebody that God can trust and God can use. And I feel like if I can say, Holy Spirit, here I am today. It's not just another Monday. It's your day. It's not just another day at work. It's your day at work. It's not just another trip to the gas station. I promise you, Lord, I hope somebody sick walks into my office today because if they do, I can't wait to tell them about the healer. If you are interested in a life that will continually blow your mind, can I introduce you to a life with the Holy Spirit at the steering wheel? Is this helping anybody? wonder how well do you know him. Throw this at you. I got like three other things I'm going to say. And then we're going to get really weird with it. We're gonna, kidding. We're going to bring out some animals. We're going to sacrifice them. Why does all this matter? Why am I so passionate about it? Because without the power of the Holy Spirit, the entire faith picture is incomplete. The whole thing. So if you're like, man, I could, I could do without this. I hate going to churches where they talk about the Holy Spirit. Good for you. Without the Holy Spirit, the entire thing is incomplete. You take the Holy Spirit out of this, this is where you get rules. This is where you get regulations. This is where you get the commission. This is where you get the calling. But you get no power to actually do what God has called you to do. And this is why you see people come into our churches and get saved, and you can't find them a year later. Why? Because barely do we have time to introduce anybody to the power of the Holy Spirit. So you get somebody in Manhattan or maybe Frisco, Texas, who comes in, they put their hand up and say, I want you, Jesus. I'm a sinner. I'm broken, and I need to change. And then we get them in church, and what do we do? We're like, great, glad you're here. Here's the Bible. Here's a next step course. Here's things you can't say. Here's things you can say. Don't ever drink. Don't ever smoke. Don't ever have sex. Don't even look at women ever again. Don't ever dance. Don't ever have fun. Don't watch that. Don't do this. Do that. Change this. Change that. Oh, yeah. The Holy Spirit. And we can't figure out why people are sitting in our churches desperate to change, and they get, come in light, and they actually leave heavier than they did in the first place because we're dumping religion on them. What if we began to reverse that? Where somebody gets saved and we say, hey, so glad you're here. I know you got issues and I know you got drama and I know you got stuff you need to change. But before we have another word, can I tell you about the advocate? Has anybody told you about the chain breaker, the way maker, the one who can breathe life into your dead bones? What would our churches look like if we had new converts leaving our churches going, you know what? I'm a mess, but the Holy Spirit is going to make me better every single day. I will get through my addiction. When I fall, not if, when I fall, the Holy Spirit is going to give me the power to stand up, repent, get clean again, and walk forward. When I stumble, not if, the Holy Spirit will take from what is God's, and he will give it to me just like Jesus said. Power is what we need. You ever looked around your life and gone, Lord, I need some more power in this prayer. I need some more power in this worship. Oh, none of y'all need that? Maybe it's just us weird New Yorkers. Maybe in Texas, everyone's like, I'm good. I got four guns on me right now. <laughs> but we need power. And I feel like, Pastor Keith, I don't know if you agree with me on this. I think you will. I don't think in America it's been an outright rejection of the things of the Holy Spirit. I think it's been more of a fatigue due to the counterfeit that has turned so many people off to the Holy Spirit. I grew up in a house with a godly man who loved Jesus and taught me about the power of the Holy Spirit. My dad walked around the house singing in tongues. That's all I've ever known. But my dad was the real deal. Most people have had at least 10 bad experiences with something having to do with the Holy Spirit. They've seen somebody on TV who said, you give me $100, I'm going to give you 100 prayers, and the Holy Spirit's going to breathe it to you. <laughs> And that's weird. We can laugh. I mean that to be funny because it is. Or, you know, even the way we package the Holy Spirit in church, we use terms we would never use. I've been in a service where someone's like, come on up here. Come on, catch the Holy Ghost. I had a friend go, I've caught enough stuff in the world. I don't need to catch something else. The Holy Spirit is not a disease to be caught. 
Or maybe you've been in some church where someone has forced you to do something you don't want to do. Or they've told you that unless you speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, which is a lie. Speaking in tongues is not the proof of, it is providence of the presence of God. It is your right, but if that's something you haven't accessed yet, it doesn't make you less holy or less filled. So as a result, we have an entire generation that's pushed back from everything having to do with the Holy Spirit. Healing, I don't want to touch that because it's weird. Prophecy, I don't want any parts of it because it's weird. So we have lost the essence of our faith because people have hijacked it and we have left the real thing out there for people to see for what it is. I promise you this. I remember talking to a guy uh, when I first got saved. I was reading about the Holy Spirit. I was in a church that was great, but I don't think it was necessarily flowing in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I said, sir, he was my boss at the time. I said, sir, I've been in church for a while now. How come we never talk about the Holy Spirit? This is rural, deep Virginia, where I'm from. He goes, let me tell you something, Carl. In our church, we, uh, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit much because he's a little bit wild. He's a little bit crazy. So we kind of leave him over here. We love him. We revere him. But we focus on the good Lord up in heaven. God bless the good Lord. We love the good Lord. And we talk about his son, Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we don't want things to get reckless. We don't want things that we're not expecting to happen. Sometimes you bring the Holy Spirit in a church service, and it could go a different direction. We don't want that. We need our church to be right on time, going the same place at the same time. So we just want to keep it safe. I remember hearing him say that, going, everything you're scared of is exactly what I need in my life. I don't need more structure. I don't need more predictability. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I need power when I pray. I need power when I worship. I need power to walk into a city like Manhattan and believe that God is still going to do what he said he's going to do. There's anybody who's desperate. To feel the power of God. It's not about going to church more. It's not about learning more Bible. Both important. It's about you saying, Holy Spirit, can you breathe on this? Somebody I love is sick. I need them to be healed. There is a stronghold over my family, Lord. I need it to be broken. The Holy Spirit can do that. Let me keep this moving. I want to stay there, but I won't. But I will. But I won't. (laughs) No, you should see how big this clock is. And also the man who orchestrates the clock. (laughs) Whatever you do, please don't let this age of critical analysis turn into spiritual paralysis in your life. It is not politically correct, it is not popular, it is not cool, and it is not conventional wisdom to bet your whole life on the power of the Holy Spirit. But we have to continue to press in anyway. I'm going to say it again, because I even believe prophetically where this church right here is going, it will be continually following the path of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to rage against culture. It's going to rage against popular opinion. It might cost you a friendship. It might even someday cost you a job. But I promise you this. We will not let this age and this genre of critical analysis cause us to stop. we got to continue to pursue the Holy Spirit anyway. Why am I saying all that? Because if you're not careful, you can come into church, hear stuff like this, and you go out to where it really matters, and you start to hesitate. Because everybody's a critic. Everybody has an opinion. So you have a chance to pray for somebody. Right when you do it, you're going to say, well, I don't want to offend them. Or maybe you hear somebody who's searching, and rather than say, hey, come to my church on Friday night, man. We're going to have a meeting. Everybody's welcome. The power of God could fall. We're going to hesitate because we're afraid that somebody might not understand. The first thing we have to do as Christians is put all that aside and go, you know what? I might not get invited back to every party. I might not be the most popular person in my city, but what I will be is an obedient man of God. And if the Holy Spirit leads me to do what he wants me to do, I'm going to do it day in and day out every single time. I promise you, it's what's making the difference in churches all over America. Not cool people, not wealthy individuals. It's people who are willing to step out, even in the face of those that don't understand. I learned this lesson, I feel like, early on as a Christian man, and I'm still kind of trying to step up into it, but I'll never forget a guy walked up to me, and he said, Carl, uh, you've gone a little bit weird, haven't you? I said, what do you mean? He goes, you're into that Holy Spirit hocus-pocus stuff, aren't you? 
And I said, well, I'm not sure what you're referring to. He goes, well, first of all, I can't even believe you go to church anymore. You do realize nobody that's intellectually sound goes to church anymore. I mean, I can't believe anybody ever shows up. I mean, you, have, you guys still really promote this? Like you need that big of a crutch through life? And I said, well, if you're going to talk reckless, talk correctly. Okay, we don't need a crutch as Christians. We need the hospital bed. We need the IV. We need the whole building. So if you're going to throw stones, make sure you throw the right ones. And he said, but, I mean, do you guys, do you, you believe in uh, speaking in, in the tongue? And I was like, I believe it's plural, but yes, we do. He said, you believe in all the supernatural power? I said, yeah, we do. And he said, well, I think you're ridiculous. And in this moment, I had two thoughts. My first thought was to headbutt him just real quick and get forgiveness later. And then my option B, Steve, was just to say, I said, well, why don't you come to church then? I mean, if it's so fake and everything in there is so, so fake, you got nothing, nothing to fear. Just come in and, and be a part of it. You'll have fodder for days. And he goes, I'll take you up on that. My friend came to church with me. And I remember going that day, I had him and four other friends that were overtly critical. And it was one of those days, I'll be honest with you, where I prayed that it would just not be that Sunday where the sound demons were prevalent. It would not be that Sunday where Sister Martha, who's just way too friendly and weird, nobody taught her social awareness, is going to do all the long hugging. Like I just said, Lord, let it be a straight, easy, perfect service in the name of Jesus. And my pastor, who was led by the Holy Spirit, had the audacity to get up, and he's like, hey, how y'all doing? Uh, today, you know, I had a friend come in town, and I really felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to have him preach this morning. I'm like, oh, my God. And he got this man up, and he was an old-school, true blue prophet, about 85 years old. And for those of you who are not familiar with the office of the prophet, we believe that prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit that should still be functioning in the church today. And he was a classic prophet. He was old and he was grumpy. It's like he went to bed grumpy, woke up grumpy. All he does is talk to God, one of those guys. And we're in this service and he just starts to move. He just starts to, in the atmosphere shifted. Y'all been in a service where all of a sudden, just in the blink of an eye, you can feel the presence of God. And he just started to do what he was doing. And he's calling people out, words of knowledge from heaven. And it was amazing. My friend the whole time was like, look at this guy. I bet you he's got an earpiece. I mean, I saw that on some show. I mean, I'm sure this is a, a, a sham of, of some sort. And I just kept looking at him. And the whole time he would be preaching, he kept looking at our row. And I'm hip to the prophecy game. Like, I came ready. Like, I had a prophecy shirt on. Like, every time he came near me. And he's just sitting there looking, looking. And then he starts calling people forward. And he says, come on up here if you're sick. And sick people started coming up. And he started praying for them. And they started to, some of them, fall down under the power of the Holy Spirit, which is still legitimate. It still happens. It should be something that we see in our services. And if you're somebody that believes like that's disingenuous, my dad always taught me, Carl, if you're ever uh, guilty of judging somebody else's response to ministry, look in the mirror because you've got bigger problems than they do. That settled that for me, and I'm sure there were people that night that were not genuine because of the way they fell. Like, if the Holy Spirit hits you, you're not going to fall like this. Like, some of those people were. It was a charity fall. That's what we call that. Y'all had those bad experiences summer camp? Like, a, a counselor's just praying for you, and you're like, I'm just so tired of getting prayed for, so you go down. It happens. And after he's praying for these people, he looks, he looks at my row, and he goes, You come on up here. And my friend looked at me. I looked at him. I said, don't look at me. He's talking to you. He goes, what should I do? I said, don't ask me, tough guy. I mean, he's a fake, right? You go up there. You got nothing to fear. My friend went up there, stood right in front of this man as a skeptical, God-hating, God-loathing young man. He stood in front of this old prophet. He put his hand on his head. He said, young man, I'm going to pray for you. And he started to tell him things that only God Almighty would know about him. And I saw my friend weep, and the next thing I know, I'm on the floor with my friend, and we're looking up at the ceiling. And he looks over at me, and he tries to apologize. I said, don't apologize. Welcome to how good our God is. He's not afraid of your doubt. He's not afraid of your fear. He's not afraid of your criticism. If you give God a window, he will open up your whole life. I wonder tonight, ah, I got to stop this. I'm going to shut this down. You can stay standing because I'm going to hand this back over to your pastor. I'm going to close, but I got four closings. 
and my heart is heavy. Because I've seen a lot of people try so hard to be good Christians. And they fail and they get bitter and then they get removed. And the antidote's always the Holy Spirit. And I promise you this tonight, I do believe there's something this is kind of off script, which makes sense because we're talking about the Holy Spirit. But there's something in this atmosphere tonight where I don't know why you're here, but God has more for you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit for you. And I promise you this, if you go this direction, not everybody's going to understand it. It will get you into some trouble. But it will be the best kind of trouble in your life. The Holy Spirit is not going to lead you into weirdness. It's not going to weird you, uh, lead you into being out of touch. It's going to lead you directly to the heart of people. And it'll change your world. It'll change the way you do business. It'll change the way you dream. And the Holy Spirit, I remember getting to New York, and I just said, Lord, I don't know how we're going to win this city, but we're going to follow the path of the Holy Spirit. If we've got to break tradition, so be it. If we've got to offend some people, so be it. We are going to do whatever we have to do to reach people. And I was amazed about how amazing the Holy Spirit would be to lead us to people that sometimes other people wouldn't care about. I remember uh, year two. This is when your pastor sending me texts week in and week out. Every week I think I'm going to quit. I get a message, Pastor Keith, don't quit. How did he know? I walked outside. We had at this time nine services in Manhattan. And uh, we walked outside to go greet the people that had waited for three hours to be a part of a 930 service. And I walked outside with a couple of my friends. And uh, we looked at the corner you know, of Irving Plaza, you know, that is in Union Square, and there was a man laying in a curb. You could tell that was kind of his house, and uh, I remember right before I walked in, I saw what's going on over there. I went, went over to see this man, and I'll never forget it because he had a long beard, almost like Santa, and he had a hat on that let us know he was a veteran, and right away my heart goes out to him because my father, my great-great-grandfather fought for our country and was wounded, and I believe like our country has so much work to do when it comes to honoring men and women that have given so much for our country and so I walked over to this man and I felt the Holy Spirit spurring me to do this and that's what happens when you give control to the way maker and I said sir what are you doing tonight and he goes you're looking at it son I'm hanging out right here and I said uh you got plans in about 10 minutes he goes no why I said there's this great church that meets right here you should come and he looked at me and he goes I ah, son look at me I don't belong in any church you know I smell bad and I look weird and I said I know the guy who runs it <laughs> He looks weird. He smells bad. You're going to fit in. Trust me, it's not a big deal. He looked at me. He said, no, nah, I can't go in. People like me don't belong in churches. And I said, sir, what can I do to convince you? And he holds up this beer can. And he goes, to be honest with you, son, I can't go anywhere without this. And this one's empty. And I don't want to disrupt the service. And I said, sir, if I'm hearing you correctly tonight, if I go get you a beer, you'll come sit in church? And he goes, well, I, I guess that's what I'm saying. I said, sir, there is a bodega right there. I'll buy you six if that's what it's going to take to get you into church. He goes, that's a deal. And we walked over. We got him a, a drink that he needed. And he came into church with me. And the worship was amazing. He was like, this is awesome. And I, was, I said, I'll be right back. And went up to lead the service. And I got up there. He was like, And he sat there in the front row, and he just sat there with his sweet eyes. I'll never forget it, looking at me. And at one point, I went to get a drink, and uh, I said, like I always do, I said, cheers. And he held up a beer. He said, thanks for the beer, Pastor. I said, not now. Worst time. <laughs> and I remember him sitting there with his veteran hat on. Who knows the scars he carried in there. And I watched him throughout the course of 30 minutes drop the beer, listen to me. And the first person that put his hand up. At the end of that service to receive Jesus was my friend. And I remember hugging him and going home that night and telling my wife, if God took us home tonight, I would feel like we did our job because that man deserved to see Jesus for who he is. And I felt like everybody was there. I came back the next week and a woman came up to me and she said, Pastor Carl, I want you to know that I'm leaving the church. And I said, why? She said, last week I was here and I saw you... Uh, next to a man who was drinking a beer in church. He's like, you've gone too far. You've gone over the edge. We can't have that in church. I mean, I said, ma'am, to our credit, we're having church in a bar. And, I, and she said, no, it's just too far. It's too much into the culture, and we can't let that kind of stuff happen. I said, ma'am, I respect you, and I hear you. May I give you my reasoning for a moment? She said, sure. I said, look, we're not condoning behavior. 
We're not condoning whatever he was doing. All we're saying is in this situation, there is a priority list of problems. There is a priority list of issues. And because we know that our God is not starting with the beer in his hand, but the heart that beats in his chest, it is our job as Christians to do whatever we can do to make sure that we give this man the right to hear the voice of heaven. And if we do our job right, he'll meet Jesus. The Holy Spirit will take control, and we won't have to tell him to put the beer down because the power of the Holy Spirit will lift his head so he'll put it down himself. Look, this life isn't for everybody. But it is for men in Texas tonight that say, Lord, I want all you have for me. If that means I got to lay down what I've known, I want to do it. If that means I got to forget some of the stuff that's turned me off in the name of Jesus, this is a new day. So I'm going to pray right now. I just want you to bow your head just for a moment. I want you to think about how good God has been. I want you to think about the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to ask you this. Does God have more for you tonight? Because I believe that he does. And we're going to worship whatever they have on their heart. My, my, my plea for you tonight would be this. As we worship, will you cry out to God? Will you say, Holy Spirit, have your way? Because I've been in meetings, and the best part of church meetings are when the preachers stop. And the Holy Spirit begins to do what only he can do. That's when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's when I felt the power of God. It was in a moment of just sitting there saying, Lord, I don't even get all this. But if there's a language I can speak that's going to help me reach more people, I want to speak it. If there's something in the Bible I need to see with fresh eyes, I want to see it. If there's somewhere for me to jump in, Lord, I want you to push me because I won't go on my own. But tonight it's here for the taking. Father, I pray that in your presence tonight, you would unlock things that have been locked up for too long. Insecurity cannot stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lack cannot stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Tonight, Lord, will you do what only you can do? I pray for those men that have been locked up in their emotions for too long. Let tears flow tonight pray for men that have been hanging on to bitterness for too long. Holy Spirit, that's what you do. You break the bindage. You break the, the chains of bitterness, Lord. You let us live free in the name of Jesus. We speak that tonight. For men that can't forgive themselves, Lord, I thank you, Holy Spirit. You are the advocate. You are the comforter. You're the one that reminds us of what God has said when we desperately don't want to hear it. We speak truth tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, if you believe it, can you shout amen?